In the uh, first live concert of the new season on Sunday, May 23rd in Umstead Hall, the Canton Symphony Orchestra will present works by two composers, the Octet for Strings, Opus 20, by Felix Mendelssohn, and the Symphony No. 29 in A by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, it is interesting in this context to parallel the lives of five composers of that approximate time period, all of German heritage, and to what extent they overlap uh, centered around the figure of Felix Mendelssohn. Rather than detailing a list of their birth and death dates, I found it easier to fix my compass point on the year of Mendelssohn's birth, 1809. Oldest among these was Franz Joseph Haydn, who at the age of 77 departed this world the, the very same year that Mendelssohn entered it, leaving behind an enormous catalog of music, among which we find over 100 symphonies and 70 or 80 string quartets, uh, depending on who's counting. Mozart, who had passed in 1791, was dead these 18 years, including in his vast oeuvre 41 or more symphonies to his credit, among them the number 29 on our concert program and at least 25 string quartets, and so much more, of course. These two composers represent the great masters of the classical period. That's two down and two more to go. Ludwig van Beethoven in 1809 was 39 or 40 years old, and it seems most appropriate that his musical gift to the newborn Mendelssohn, if such a gift was to be given, was his recently composed and published Symphony No. 6, the Pastoral, with three more to go, seven, eight, and nine, and to be the herald of the Romantic period. I also include Louis Spohr, just 25 years old in 1809, already a violin virtuoso, who in his lifetime composed around 35 string quartets, and within the span of Mendel Mendelssohn's life, four double quartets, keep that figure in mind, as well as six or seven string quintets, all probably well known to our central figure. So, at his birth, Mendelssohn sat comfortably within the Romantic period. I cite these statistics because they encompass the transition from the core of the classical period into the emerging Romantic period and to draw our attention to the significant developments in musical creativity and invention that occurred during that time. For one thing, the tinkling harpsichord that dominated the 18th century gradually gave way in the 19th to the far more versatile and powerful voice of the pianoforte, soft, strong. Other instruments, wind and brass, had been substantially improved in range and construction and uniformly synchronized so the two or more could play together and be on pitch. The new music of this transitional generation was becoming daringly complex, placing greater virtuoso demands on the performers, adding uh, additional instruments and consequently requiring substantially larger uh, ensembles. Chamber music was gradually moving out of the chamber and the intimate princely royal estates and the salons and moving into the spacious concert halls which soon proliferated all over uh, Europe well into the 19th century, now more readily accessible to great numbers of the general public. These innovations came about at the height of the classical period evident in the complexity of the later Mozart symphonies and the appealing musical devices that informed so many of the later Haydn symphonies. Orchestras were getting bigger, audiences were getting bigger, and of necessity, so were the concert halls. But the one instrument family that did not change, at least not very much, was the string section with their mellow gut strings. In order to uh, equal the intensity of the burgeoning orchestra, the number of violins, violas, cellos, and basses were increased substantially so as to form the bulk of the symphony orchestra. This created a problem for the traditionally intimate chamber-sized compositions like the string quartet, and more specific for our purpose, the string octet. Heard in a small room or chamber, the four strings were in their element, but put a string quartet or an octet on stage before several hundred patrons or a thousand or more in a great hall, there was a serious acoustic problem. Something had to be done. Well, re-enter Louis Spohr, a prolific composer in the Romantic period, 25 years old, as I said, at the time of Mendelssohn's birth. But when Mendelssohn died in 1847, he was only 38 years old. Spohr was to outlive him by another 12 years. 
But within the period when their lives overlapped, Spohr introduced the unique concept of the double quartet, composing four of them in all between 1823 and 1847. Now, this raises an interesting question directly referencing Mendelssohn's string octet. Spohr's double quartet would consist of two distinctly separated string quartets, each made up of two violins, one viola, and one cello. But the concept of a string octet was unknown up to this time, so it comes as no surprise that Spohr would refer to his eight-member string ensemble as a double quartet. That made more sense to his audience than would a string octet, which in Mendelssohn's unique case would consist of four violins, two violas, and two cellos. A little quick mental exercise would demonstrate that we're talking about two approaches to the same ensemble. So what would be the difference? Spohr was actually responding to a proposal from a dear friend that he consider composing something new and different, a double quartet. Let me quote from the album notes of Maurice Powell, included in the Spohr uh, recording. Spohr's enthusiasm for this ideal medium was unbounded, and he was confident in pioneering, pioneering a whole new kind of instrumental work. He was especially attracted by the prospect of utilizing the richer textures that would inevitably result from the subtle antiphonal interplay between two equal yet independent quartets often in dialogue, dialogue and opposition to each other. The first two double quartets in particular concentrate Spohr's characteristic concertante brilliance exclusively in the first quartet with the other quartet performing an accompanying role. So I imagine that we are to visualize two quartets set apart on the stage, quartet number one to the left and quartet number two to the right. That's a perfect setup for a conventional stereophonic recording. Now to Mendelssohn's octet in E-flat major, opus 20. In the program notes for the San Francisco Symphony, the annotator has this to say, whereas in Spohr's double quartets, the two string quartets operate as independent units, Mendelssohn, by contrast, blends the eight instruments into a new saturated sound using his eight instruments as a single ensemble capable of many interactive permutations. At times, says another annotator, Mendelssohn's octet seems about to turn into a small symphony. In this regard, Mendelssohn octet is quite closely related to the dozen string symphonies he composed between 1820 and 1823 which he actually conducted with professional muse musicians who came to dinner in the family home during the young composer's 11th to 14th years. So we can see that only three years later, Felix had the talent and the authority to provide strict instructions printed in the published score. This octet must be played by all instruments in symphonic orchestral style. Pianos and fortes must be strictly observed and more strongly emphasized than, in usual, than is usual in pieces of this character. The octet was composed in late summer of 1825 when Mendelssohn was about 17 and a half years old, dedicated to his friend and violin teacher, the famous virtuoso Edouard Rietz. The florid first violin part stands as a complement to Rietz's ability filled with a sort of virtuosity that would impress and challenge his former teacher. So says the annotator of the program notes. The first of the four movements is identified as a preliminary allegro moderato ma con fuoco, moderately happy but with fire. Let's listen to a selection from the very beginning in which the first violin soars above the ensemble to the highest notes of the instrument, which must have made his teacher thrill with pride per selection.
The first movement tumbles forth with blistering energy, drama, and technique, says one annotator, but rivets the intention of the listener by its incredible interplay of the various string voices. After the brilliant introductory passage we've just heard, the momentum is sustained through the better part of the movement, seemingly exhausting itself in a passage of adagio-like serenity. And just as you think the movement is about to end softly, we are suddenly caught up in a cascade of dense, whirling figures, a glorious storm of sound that carries through to a bravura finale. This is very exciting music. And if you ever thought that a string quartet or even an octet of strings could not take your breath away, you'll be pleasantly surprised. The Andante follows, which by the presence of the four additional string voices, produces a rich and dense harmonization, lengthy melodies, emotionally profound as it flows quietly and peacefully along. Still, we can sense a kind of suppressed energy which manages on one occasion to break out with a brief impassioned episode. Excerpt number two. Mendelssohn's personal satisfaction with the third movement scherzo is immediately evident in his description of it as allegro leggerissimo, an Italian superlative meaning very, very light and happy. Although scored pianissimo, it surges forward with driving momentum, a kind of perpetuum mobile that is both hypnotic and bewitching in a way, immediately calling to mind the spirit of his Midsummer Night's Dream music. Mendelssohn's sister Fanny said it was intended to invoke the Walpurgis Night episode in Goethe's Faust, actually trying to set to music these lines from that scene. Cloudy flight and misty gauze brighten from above, air in the leaves and wind in the reeds, and all is scattered asunder. And indeed it is. Fanny goes on to say, I was the only person he told what he had in mind. The whole piece is played staccato and pianissimo, the individual tremolandi and the sudden trills. Everything is so new, so unfamiliar, and yet so appealing and friendly that one feels close to the spirit world. Indeed, one feels lifted aloft with such lightness that one would fain pick up a broomstick in order the better to follow the airy throng. At the end, the first violin flutters its feathery wings and all is scattered asunder. Excerpt number three.
The last movement, a presto, meaning quickly, begins with an aggressive rhythm set off by the two cellos and joined by the upper strings in a frenzied mood. We might even say it picks up right where the scherzo left off. In fact, there are several obvious references back to the previous movement. Great tension builds almost beyond endurance, which may cause some listeners to edge forward in their seats. Excerpt number four. The finale begins as a light-hearted, whimsical fugue compounded of brilliant contrapuntal technique and mercurial humor, so says another annotator. Excerpt number 4B. The presto ends quite brilliantly, which you must anticipate from our ensemble, since I refuse to spoil the pleasure and surprise of your first hearing, if indeed it is. All this from our very own ensemble of eight musicians filling Umstadt Hall with their glorious sound, proof that you don't always need a big orchestra to inflame your emotions and to elicit an outburst of applause from our audience at its conclusion, as I am sure it will we must again remind ourselves that this astonishing, astonishing music comes from the mind of a 17-year-old boy. Harking back to the time of Mendelssohn, few people indeed heard the string octet in its original setting, perhaps once or twice in a lifetime, if that, but they may have heard it or a version of it in their own homes. Mendelssohn sensibly and profitably arranged this popular item for piano forehands and the published version made its way into many private homes equipped with a piano and hopefully two competent players. And we have the pleasure now to present for you a short clip from that version. Excerpt number five.
There is one other item of interest regarding that scherzo of the octet. You see, the third movement of the octet was later to find its way into the list of his orchestrated works as the scherzo in G minor. Mendelssohn made this shortened and orchestrated version of the octet movement to replace the minuet and trio of his first symphony, the C minor, when he directed the work at a concert of the Philharmonic Society in London, England in May 1829. So let's listen to an excerpt from Mendelssohn's symphonic version of the scherzo, excerpt number six. On the other hand, what if you had access to a full string orchestra? Well, Mendelssohn took care of that possibility as well. In fact, a number of Mendelssohn works appear in multiple instrumental versions prepared by the composer himself or by others. Likewise, such chamber works as string quartets, the sounds of which were lost in the large concert halls, were often arranged for full string orchestras, as was the case with Mendelssohn's octet. For me, this calls to mind a somewhat later encounter with one of my very favorite composers. According to Gustav Mahler, an ensemble of only four people alone on an otherwise empty stage performing one of Beethoven's late string quartets would be lost in the vast space of a modern concert hall. I think he used the word pathetic. And he explored the possibility of performing Beethoven's Opus 95 string quartet as well as Schubert's Death in the Maiden making use of a full orchestral string section. Other examples come to mind right into our own times. The German conductor Hans von Bulow and Jeffrey Tate in England both took on Beethoven's unplayable Grosse Fuge. Toscanini, Leonard Bernstein, and Andre Previn, the Opus 135. Murray Pariah, in his conductorial debut, performed and recorded an arrangement of the Opus 127. And yes, even the Mendelssohn Octet has been recorded by several contemporary string orchestras. The pairing of these two items, the Mozart Symphony No. 29 and the Mendelssohn Octet, was obviously a decision made by our music director, Gerhard Zimmermann. And yet, there are several important subliminal connections. Two very different works, almost exactly a half century apart in time, Mozart's Symphony No. 29, composed in 1774, when he was only 18 years old, and Mendelssohn's Octet, composed in 1825, when he was only about 17 and a half years old. Mozart's Symphony No. 29 represents a turning point in his youthful evolution as a composer, which we can attribute to his visit to Vienna from July to September in 1773 and the vastly different musical atmosphere he found in the imperial capital compared to the more provincial Salzburg, where he came from. Here he became acquainted with the new music of a litany of great names, chief among them his friend and idol, Franz Joseph Haydn, including some of the recently composed Sturm und Drang symphonies, such as the Mercury, Farewell, and the Maria Theresia. So the symphony we will hear, number 29 in A, was completed following uh, the following April after his return to Salzburg. In the notes by Neil Zaslov in volume four of the complete Mozart symphony printed by Loiseau Lyre, he offers this constructive analysis. The concert symphony achieves its purpose solely through a sonorous, brilliant, and fiery manner of writing. The best concert symphonies 
contained great and bold ideas. In effect, concert music, especially of this period, appeals through the very variety of internal devices of a skilled and ingenious composer. Thus, they are most meaningful to the musician who is well indoctrinated in the language and construction of music. If there are messages or meanings intended by the composer, they are treated in a general way, vague at best. For the general audience, they are treated in, um, the, I'm sorry, for the general audience, rather than probe for profound meanings or latent interpretations, it will be the cleverness, the sadness, the joy, the energy, and other emotions, such terms of expression, which will provide the most satisfaction. According to one annotator in Symphony No. 29, we hear conventions Mozart had used before, but somehow these conventions have been elevated to something greater, more complex, and subtler in tone. Two of the miracles of this enchanting work are its perfect classical balance between grace and energy and Mozart's ability to draw the maximum of color and expression out of a very small orchestra composed of a few strings and a pair of oboes and horns. The first movement is an allegro moderato, meaning moderately happy, is both charming and witty, and provides the listener with a pleasant feeling of well-being. The second movement is an andante and accordingly moves at a leisure pace utterly relaxed, walking serenely through a garden in springtime, finally arriving at the destination. Of this pleasant movement, one annotator described it as the symphony's warmly beating heart, a serenade for muted violins with limited use of the winds, which, to quote a musicologist Edward Downes, reveals an enchanting Rococo ornamentation and delicate texture, which seems closer to that of a string quartet than of a symphony. It also has a sadness, a depth of feeling that is pure Mozart. After a deceptively genteel opening, the third movement, the Minuetto and Trio, evolves into a propulsive minuet with nervous dotted rhythms and sudden fortissimos centered with a graceful trio as described by one of my sources. And the last movement is appropriately described as an allegro con spirito, and is as happy with spirit as its name implies, filled with energy and harmonically rich in the style of Haydn's hunting finales, complete with horn calls. This was a popular device among composers in Mozart's day, providing a brilliant conclusion to what many consider Mozart's first symphonic masterpiece. If I might offer a concluding personal observation on the two items selected for this concert, at this particular time of crisis in our lives, both begin in joy, descend into a period of serenity, we might even say melancholy, but revive with hope and expectation and conclude with a sense of triumph and rejoicing, returning to the way things were not so very long ago. Great music can also be a remedy for the spirit and the soul. So may it be for all of us in the days and weeks to follow. My exit music is the finale of Mozart's Symphony No. 29, Allegro con Spiritu, Happily with Spirit.